Uh, hello, my name is Carl Dyseroth. I'm in the departments of bioengineering and psychiatry at Stanford University. Uh, I'll tell you uh, about optogenetics uh, today. What you can see here is uh, a painting actually done by one of my graduate students, Emily, who you'll hear about later, uh, representing optogenetics. And then uh, here on the right you can see a mouse that's actually in the process of undergoing an optogenetic intervention. Uh, let's get into some detail on how exactly this technology works and what it is. Optogenetics is combining genetics and optics to achieve what you might call a gain or a loss of function of well-defined events, but not of genes. Instead of things like trains of action potentials uh, within specific cells of living tissue, uh, even within freely moving mammals. What you can see here uh, are some of the uh, organisms which uh, give rise to these single component microbial opsin genes that we find to be useful in optogenetics. These are single genes that both receive light and give rise to ion flow, uh, all encompassed within a single open reading frame. Uh, one thing we found back in 2004 and 2005 is that we could take one of uh, these genes from uh, this organism here, Chlamydomonas reinhardii, uh, the gene was channel rhodopsin, and we could put that into mammalian neurons. And here are two separate neurons receiving the same blue light pulse train, and we can elicit action potentials coming from uh, these uh, two neurons that are uh, almost identical. So this is what you might call a, a gain of function of uh, uh, the neural code. Now, uh, one can deliver loss of function as well. Uh, in fact, uh, one can deliver hyperpolarizing or inhibiting uh, interventions, for example, with this chloride pump. Uh, the combination of these uh, uh, different kinds of capability give rise to the following situation. Instead of uh, the case with electrodes where you have high speed interventions but poor precision in terms of the target, you can't control uh, which of these uh, circuit elements is being controlled. With optogenetics you can capitalize on the uh, 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 specificity of introduction of the gene uh, into one element or another and deliver precise excitation or inhibition, uh, uh, even bathing the entire tissue in light. One can turn cells on or off, one can modulate biochemical events with uh, substantial uh, temporal uh, precision and uh, precision with regard to the kind of intervention that's experienced by the cell. Now, this uh, encounters some technical challenges which took a few years to solve. One issue is how do you get light deep into mammalian brain tissue? This is a, a scattering problem and an absorption problem. Uh, for example, you can see in this lower curve here, uh, there's a very steep drop-off of light power density or irradiance as a function of depth in tissue. It's a log-log scale, and you can see you're down to 1% of your initial light power density at only 1 millimeter depth in tissue. It's true red-shifted light will penetrate more deeply than blue light, but still the essence of the problem is the same as you can see there. The way we solve this is, uh, for example, with fiber optics. We can use fiber optics to access any area of the brain that we want in freely moving uh, mammals, and uh, this affords us substantial uh, experimental and technical uh, uh, versatility. Uh, these tools uh, uh, originated in 2007, and uh, we published a recent uh, review of the latest technology in 2011. Uh, you can see the references there. Now, there were other challenges as well. For example, how do you target with versatility and generalizability in the tissue? Now, there are, just by the very fact that you're introducing the opsin into tissue, you gain some specificity already, and that's illustrated in the top row here. What you can see is that you, if we introduce the opsin gene into, for example, brain region B, we have specificity when we deliver light because only the cell bodies that are present in that region are light sensitive. The other cells that may be elsewhere in the brain that are sending in their axons, uh, those axons will not be light sensitive. And so you uh, have specificity that you would not have with an electrode. An electrode introduced into that region will drive those axons as well as the local cell bodies. So there's already uh, a kind of specificity which is uh, uh, quite useful. Now, one can take that to the next level. For example, as illustrated in this middle row, one can use genetic targeting strategies such as promoters or recombinase driver lines and recombinase dependent viruses to uh, make light sensitive only a subset of cells within that tissue. And then what one can do is deliver light and only the targeted cell population within that region is being controlled. 
of course, that requires some genetic knowledge, uh, either of a promoter or having a, a, a recombinase driver line. Uh, another targeting strategy which can work together with all of these, but requires no genetic information at all, is what we call projection targeting. And there, you introduce your uh, opsin gene, and one delivers light not to the transduced region, but to a downstream region where uh, axons might be uh, sent in. And this allows you to recruit the population of cells that is in B that sends axons to region A. Uh, this is uh, quite versatile. You only need to know the anatomy. Uh, it's important to stress, uh, as we have, that uh, the entire cell may be recruited. Uh, the cell that resides in B and that sends its axon to A will also uh, send perhaps collaterals to other uh, brain regions as well. And uh, what you're doing is recruiting a cell defined by its projection. Uh, one can deliver inhibition or excitation by this method, and it's quite uh, versatile. So uh, this panoply of methods for targeting have turned out uh, to actually be practical in mammals. Uh, in 2007, we were able to achieve gain of function of mammalian behavior. Uh, uh, this was in collaboration with our colleagues, Luis uh, de la Sea, uh, and Antoine Adamantidis and Feng Zhang. And together, what we found was that we could target uh, a population of cells deep in the lateral hypothalamus, the hypercretin neurons. We used a virus with a, with a specific promoter that allowed us to target the brain cells that uh, we thought were uh, modulating sleep-wake transitions. And we found that by playing in certain patterns of activity but not others, uh, we could uh, uh, drive this complex behavioral state uh, transition. Now, in this case, our targeting strategy was, uh, as shown in this virus, a 3 kilobase uh, pre-pro hypocretin uh, promoter fragment. Uh, one can be much more versatile, since the number of promoters that are small enough and strong enough and specific enough to fit into a virus are quite uh, small, uh, that are practical. What we can do is capitalize on Cree driver lines. Uh, here's the design uh, generated by Feng Zhang in the laboratory of a recombinase-dependent adeno-associated viral vector backbone. Uh, which is uh, double floxed, inverted, and only uh, expresses the opsin in the presence of Cre recombinase. Uh, this strategy was uh, shown to work in behaving mammals in 2009 when uh, uh, he and his uh, colleagues targeted the dopamine neurons within the ventral tegmental area in one paper and targeted the parvalbumin neurons in prefrontal cortex in another paper. And uh, this uh, allows one to capitalize on the large and growing resource of, of Cre driver lines. That was a gain-of-function intervention. It took uh, until 2010, until December of 2010, for a, a loss of function of mammalian behavior to be achieved. And that's uh, illustrated here. Alana Witten in the laboratory uh, was able to achieve this. And what's illustrated here is delivery of the halorhodopsin, the chloride pump that's an inhibitor, into the nucleus accumbens. These cells here, the cholinergic cells within the accumbens, were the target in this case. And she used a Cree driver line that expresses Cree recombinase only in the CHAT cells, or cholinocytotransferase expressing cells. And uh, she used the recombinase-dependent virus and delivered this third-generation halorhodopsin, uh, ENPHR 3.0, uh, into these cells to see if she could inhibit them during uh, freely moving behavior. Uh, these cells have been hypothesized to be linked to cocaine conditioning, and uh, she was able to address the question, what if you inhibit these cells in freely moving mammals? Uh, what happens to the uh, behavior? Now, what is this 3.0? This is the third generation version of the halo opsin. This is a trafficking enhanced version. Uh, these opsins come from very uh, diverse organisms that many of them don't have an endoplasmic reticulum or uh, membrane trafficking like mammalian cells. And uh, what Viviana Grodnaru in the laboratory figured out was how to add trafficking motifs to these opsins uh, to help them move to the right place in mammalian cells. And this uh, has helped every opsin that we've looked at uh, uh, substantially, uh, both in terms of getting to the membrane, getting down axons and dendrites, which of course is very important for projection targeting, and uh, for getting robust uh, behavioral effects. Now, uh, what happened in this case? Well, uh, what uh, we found was that one could inhibit the cholinergic cells in the nucleus accumbens. Uh, in a loss of function intervention, it's useful to come in, in many cases, with bilateral interventions into the bilateral brain structures that are involved to make sure you're inhibiting both uh, sides of uh, the brain that might be involved in causally giving rise to the behavior in uh, vivo. And uh, what we found was, is illustrated here, normally 
an animal will prefer to spend time in a chamber, as you can see on the left here, in the bottom row, where it previously received cocaine. You can see the path tracing here, the animal spending more time in the chamber where it had received cocaine. That normal behavior in red on the bottom is in contrast to the experimental animal in blue on the top, where the cells were inhibited. Uh, and what you can see is there's much less of a preference for the chamber where cocaine was experienced. And this was a consistent finding across many animals. This highlights a practical uh, control aspect as well for optogenetics, uh, as illustrated uh, here. In both cases, the animal is receiving the light, has the hardware implanted, and received an injection uh, of the same virus. And so it's a good uh, comparison. The only reason that this is an experimental animal is it happens to be a Cre recombinase positive animal, so it's able to uh, unlock the Cre-dependent uh, virus and express opsin. Uh, this animal is not. But that illustrates the kind of control experiment that's quite useful. The other thing is important to build in many behavioral controls. Uh, we can see the effect uh, quite prominently here, uh, but control experiments showed that there was no effect on other forms of uh, contextual memory formation, no effect on anxiety, no effect on locomotion, and that the intervention itself was not aversive, uh, as shown uh, here on the right. So this illustrates, uh, finally, loss of function, uh, uh, which uh, complemented the earlier gain of function for mammalian behavior. Now, we have, uh, of course, um, many more things that we'd like to do. We'd like to do combinatorial control. We'd like to control one population of cells alone or in combination with an another. And for this reason, we're able to bring to bear uh, many different kinds of opsins now, uh, all at once. There are uh, an incredible diversity of these uh, 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 molecular machines out there in nature. Uh, they extend through all the major kingdoms of life. Uh, many of them are illustrated here. You can see the channel rhodopsins down here in the blue. Uh, some of the inhibitory tools up there in yellow. All of these, it turns out, are substantially helped by providing membrane trafficking uh, enhancements. Now, uh, one thing one has to be careful of in thinking about the effects of one's uh, optogenetic intervention is what uh, may be happening not only within the targeted cell, as shown here, but what might be happening in, happening in the extracellular space, as shown here and how that might influence neighboring neurons that are not directly under optogenetic control. And, uh, of course, one may have various kinds of light-driven uh, transporters and pumps, but there are also many other kinds of uh, uh, transporters, of exchangers, that will be affected by the shifting uh, concentrations of ions, both on that cell and on other cells. Now, this is no... Uh, uh, surprise to physiologists, there are uh, many such uh, known processes that occur. Changes in protons, changes in potassium ions, sodium ions, chloride ions, calcium ions can all exert this sort of effect, whether in response to native activity or uh, electrical stimulation or optogenetic excitation or inhibition, but an important thing uh, to keep in mind. Now, um, one, for example, may wish to be sure that during one's exposure to light, that one is achieving the inhibition that's needed. One, it's important to do recordings uh, in various settings, whether intracellular or extracellular, to assess not only the directionality of the effect that's being exerted, but also its stability and maintenance over the course of uh, the uh, experiment. And, of course, what happens immediately after uh, the light goes off. This is important, uh, as uh, we had pointed out back in uh, 2007 and continues to be important to think about. Sometimes, uh, as we've shown, you can see very brief changes in excitability lasting, lasting for a few seconds after an optogenetic intervention. This kind of thing can be seen uh, with native uh, uh, processes as well. Uh, it's important simply to design the experiments to be aware of what happens both during and after the optogenetic intervention. Now, uh, this kind of opportunity that we have for optogenetics is uh, now uh, expanding rapidly. We've uh, uh, now, uh, together with our colleagues uh, at the University of Tokyo, uh, Osamu Nareki and Hideaki Kato, uh, have been able uh, to uh, generate channel rhodopsin chimeras that allowed us to see the uh, crystal structure at high resolution for channel rhodopsin, which has created some interesting opportunities. Uh, both for improving uh, the 
what you might call the basic science of optogenetics and uh, in improving its, uh, its power as well. And I'll explain uh, how this uh, happens. This is the crystal structure of channel rhodopsin. It is a dimer. Uh, the pore is formed not at the interface between the two monomers, but it's formed uh, when transmembrane helices one and two, uh, uh, which are tilted uh, back farther than they would normally be in another seven transmembrane protein, uh, form a pore, and each monomer has a pore. This, by the way, is all transretinal. It's a small organic chromophore that is present in all vertebrate tissues that uh, we know of. Uh, one does not have to add this to get uh, optogenetics to work in vertebrates. However, in Drosophila and in C. elegans, one typically uh, adds uh, all transretinal to the medium uh, or to the food uh, of the organism. Now, the pore here is presumably gated by the conformational change of uh, retinal that gets uh, transferred uh, to the rest of the protein. But having the crystal structure gives us a number of interesting opportunities. For example, we can see where we think the pore is. Uh, it's, it's lined with charged and polar residues. And this has let us uh, actually build uh, useful tools already. For example, uh, mutants that have mutations along the pore and have zero photocurrents now can be used as control tools. They can be expressed uh, and uh, not conduct uh, current in response to light, but occupy space in the membrane, perhaps change uh, membrane capacitance, perhaps uh, affect, uh, to the extent that this happens, uh, the distribution of other ions within the uh, cell, uh, 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 of other receptors in the cell. And uh, this is an important uh, 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 control that's actually better than simply expressing a fluorescent protein. Uh, because you've actually got a, another protein that's being uh, uh, loaded into the membrane but not uh, generating photocurrents. So the crystal structure has already been useful uh, in that regard. It also may allow us to generate different kinds of uh, conductivity. Uh, for example, we may be able to bias the uh, conductance of the pore to potassium ions or protons. In fact, nature has already shown us that it's possible for a microbial opsin to generate a ion selective channel. Uh, we found from Denaliella salina a channel rhodopsin that seems to be selective uh, for protons. And so this uh, is illustrated here. Uh, Feng Zhang identified this, and we published this in collaboration with Peter Hagemann's group. Uh, this uh, shows that it is possible to generate uh, ion selectivity with a microbial opsin. The diversity of microbial opsins out there also uh, affords us the possibility of combinatorial control controlling one cell population alone or in combination with another. This uh, organism, Volvox carteri, is a multicellular green uh, algae. Uh, it, uh, as uh, Fung identified in 2008, allows one to generate red shifted light uh, activation. The action spectrum is illustrated here. You can see there's a nice a band in the amber where VCHR1, Volvox channel rhodopsin, can be recruited, not touching a channel rhodopsin 2 expressing cell at all, which is normally uh, controlled by blue light. Now, it took a while to improve the uh, photocurrents. Uh, over years, we uh, carried out various kinds of molecular modifications that improved the expression of VCHR1 until it became a very potent molecule that we call C1V1. Uh, in collaboration with Peter Hagemann, we also were able to uh, uh, sharpen the action spectrum as shown here and create a more purely red uh, light activated tool. You can see this now uh, leads to the ability to drive action potentials with red light. Uh, and uh, as we've shown, this actually allows now combinatorial excitation even in vivo, even within freely moving uh, mammals, driving one population alone or in combination with another. And the tools and methods are described uh, in the reference. The large diversity of these tools is now uh, becoming difficult to organize and keep track of. We've uh, uh, put forth a few such organizational tables and, and uh, strategies. This is one of them. What you can see on the y-axis is the visible light action spectrum. And on the x-axis is a very useful kinetic parameter that we call the tau off. This is the time constant of deactivation of the microbial opsin uh, or the optogenetic tool uh, after you turn off the light. Just to orient you, uh, here is channel rhodopsin 2. It's got about a 10 millisecond time constant of deactivation. We've been able to speed it up uh, with the cheetah mutants that are about 4 milliseconds. 
Here are the C1 V1 tools that are red shifted and also a little slower, as you can see on this log scale. Uh, and then all the way, many orders of magnitude slower, you can see some extremely uh, persistent tools that keep their uh, currents going for very long after the light is turned off. Uh, this may seem counterintuitive, but I'll explain why these tools are useful. But all of the ones that are represented here share these key properties. They're single component, which greatly facilitates targeting, speed, robustness of the system. You don't need to add chemicals to make any of these work, even in behaving mammals. Uh, they all come from biology, which enhances their physiological tolerability. Uh, they're fast. And uh, as you can see, there's substantial spectral diversity and tunability. So what about these slow opsins? How are they useful? Well, first of all, they're generated by mutating this cysteine residue and the aspartic acid residue is shown here. And that takes this very rapid deactivation after light off, 12 milliseconds, as you can see here, to some very slow, very persistent patterns of activity that are seen uh, in these mutants here. We call these step function opsins. They become more bistable-like or step-like in their properties. And this has a couple of interesting effects. First, it makes the cells that are expressing these opsins uh, more light sensitive for long light pulses. This is because they effectively become photon integrators. The opsins don't turn off, so very low levels of light can be delivered for a long period of time. Photons accumulated by the cell uh, in turning on opsins, and you can elevate the photocurrents to the maximal levels that would have been experienced uh, with a brief higher intensity uh, pulse of light. Uh, now, that is a big effect. Many orders of magnitude increase in light sensitivity, uh, as we've shown. Uh, but you may say, well, you can't turn these off, so how useful are they? In fact, you actually can turn them off. Uh, this is a very simplified version of the photocycle of these opsins, starting from a dark state, D470, that's closed and that absorbs a blue photon, and goes to an open state where the step function opsins are stuck. This is where they stay and stay open. Uh, but you can actually shortcut back to the closed state with a green photon. So you can actually turn them on with a blue photon and off with a green photon. And this behavior is illustrated here. This allows us to, in a minimally invasive fashion, we can even take away the fiber, the light delivery source, after we deliver a pulse of excitation. You can deliver a stable increase in excitability of a targeted cell population that can be persistent and that can be terminated when you want with a pulse of a different color of light. This is illustrated here. There's got a patch clamp neuron expressing one of the opsins, receiving five identical stimuli played in through the patch pipette. But you can see the cells only responding with action potentials in the first, third, and fifth epoch. And the reason is that we've flipped on and off, on and off, on and off the step function opsin with alternating pulses of blue and green light, flipping the cell into and out of an excitable uh, state. And this has a number of advantages. First, it allows the physiology and behavior to happen in an epoch where there is not light being continuously delivered. This uh, can be useful for a number of reasons, including not having optical hardware, not continuously depositing energy into the tissue. And uh, that's turned out to be useful for social behavior studies, as we published in other studies as well. Uh, another advantage is, of course, these tools are very light these, these tools make the cells very light sensitive, and this allows you to recruit larger tissue volumes for uh, complex behaviors in mammals. And then finally, uh, what you can see here is that you're not prescribing a defined action potential pattern. The spiking pattern that the cell is eliciting is in some way capturing the native synchrony of the act, synchrony or asynchrony of the activity coming in. And uh, this basically means that you are sensitizing a cell population to its native uh, uh, pattern of activity uh, without prescribing a defined spike pattern. And so all of these uh, properties, we think, make these tools particularly useful. We've shown they work in uh, rodents. Also, Krishna Shinoi's laboratory has shown that these work uh, quite well in awake uh, behaving rhesus macaques. Uh, you can deliver a blue light pulse to motor cortex and get elevated spiking that can be terminated with a pulse of yellow light. Now, this is a, a summary of some of the optogenetic tools. Uh, now is a good time to talk a little bit about 
uh, applications, uh, particularly those that have used uh, projection targeting. One illustration of that is, illustr is illustrated here. This is a rat where a virus carrying channel adopsin 2 was introduced into motor uh, cortex, but light was delivered not to motor cortex, but to thalamus, a downstream projection target. The other interesting thing about this experiment conducted by Jin Lee and Remy Durand in the laboratory is that the readout is fMRI. And so this is the integration of optogenetics and fMRI. This is called OFMRI. And this allows one to, with all the disadvantages and caveats of fMRI, including, uh, as we all know, somewhat poor spatial and temporal resolution, at the same time, it's unparalleled for its non-invasiveness and its globality and simultaneity of, uh, it, of the readout that one can obtain. And so one can drive a defined population of cells, and then one can look throughout the entire brain at the recruitment of different brain regions. And what we could see, as we reported here, uh, is not only are we recruiting a cell that's defined by having its cell body and motor cortex, its projection the thalamus, and by the way, there was a promoter fragment used in the virus here that allowed us to pick out a subpopulation of those cells within motor cortex, so a very precisely defined population of cells. But we can look at the entire brain and see the pattern of activity that's recruited uh, across the entire brain by this population. And we can see local activity in thalamus, bold signals, but also back uh, at the motor cortex site, we can see recruitment. Uh, ipsilaterally as well. And we can map out the hemodynamic response functions, which uh, show very similar patterns, even corresponding uh, to those that are seen in uh, uh, behaving human beings in the course of sensory or behavioral uh, sti uh, stimulation, uh, including the onset, uh, offset kinetics, uh, undershoot, and recovery kinetics. This is one class of uh, intervention, another that uses projection targeting. Another experiment used behavior as a readout with projection targeting. This was an experiment carried out by Viviana Gradinaru, uh, Murtaza Mogri, uh, uh, and uh, Jamie Henderson in the laboratory. Here, we asked how deep brain stimulation might be uh, involved in, uh, and, the, and the mechanisms by which deep brain stimulation might be involved in restoring uh, normal function after a uh, uh, generation of Parkinsonian animals. Now, uh, deep brain stimulation is commonly delivered in people to uh, a deep brain structure called the subthalamic nucleus, but it had been uh, mysterious as to what it's the initial direct target of the stimulation is. An electrode, of course, will not pick apart one cell type or another, one circuit element or another. Uh, but you can imagine now the kind of experiments one could do optogenetically. One could deliver an inhibitor like this halorhodopsin, the NPHR halorhodopsin. And one could use a promoter fragment like this cam kinase 2 alpha promoter fragment to target excitatory cells, for example. Uh, but you can imagine all the different combinations one could do, turning different circuit elements on or off and seeing in these animals, which we made hemi-Parkinsonian, uh, which delivered a therapeutic uh, effect. Now, this was... An interesting process, what many of the experiments that we did had no effect. Uh, these are hemi-Parkinsonian animals, so we have a rotational readout. And uh, for, for example, inhibiting local cell bodies, as you can see here, had very little effect uh, on the rotational pathological behavior. But when we did a projection targeting experiment, as illustrated here, where the only light-sensitive element within the subthalamic nucleus was incoming light-sensitive axons coming from elsewhere, uh, including from motor cortex, there we saw very robust and reversible therapeutic effects, reduction in rotational behavior. Also, the animals, which were initially quite bradykinetic, barely moving at all, with high-frequency stimulation, could move quite freely in a reversible fashion. This suggested that the initial direct target of deep brain stimulation may be the incoming axons that are coming into the subthalamic nucleus from elsewhere. And supporting this interpretation, we found that there was a great deal of specificity uh, with regard to the precise temporal pattern of activity that mapped onto the clinical experience quite well. High-frequency stimulation was efficacious. Low-frequency stimulation, 20 hertz or beta-band stimulation, was 
not only not efficacious, but actually pathological or harmful. And this is what is seen uh, clinically as well. In fact, the crossover between therapeutic and pathological occurred at about 70 hertz, which is just what's seen clinically. It, this highlights the importance of cell type specificity, but also of the temporal precision of optogenetics. You can see if we didn't have temporal precision, we would uh, be uh, quite confused as to what is going on here. Fundamentally different effects are seen at high or low frequency. This was another example of projection targeting. Uh, this, of course, is only the tip of the iceberg, and this particular behavioral model is only the tip of the iceberg. Now, you can carry out not only a host of basic science studies, but also look at a broad range of disease-related uh, phenotypes. Uh, this is an animal uh, that is uh, hemi-Parkinsonian, but one can do, for example, psychiatric disease-related assays. One can put animals in a forced swim test. Melissa Warden in the laboratory has uh, generated this integrated optogenetic forced swim test apparatus. Uh, animals that are in this uh, apparatus will swim freely when they are tired of swimming or when they don't want to swim anymore, they'll float in the water. Uh, and one can assess the transition between the swimming and the floating behavior, which is linked to states of behavioral motivation and effort on the one hand, and uh, uh, behavioral despair or immobility on the other hand, and that in turn is affected by stress and antidepressant treatment. This interesting behavioral test can now be richly interrogated with a complex suite of uh, uh, inputs and readouts. For example, a magnet can be attached to the hind paw of the animal, an induction coil placed around the cylinder of water, and each kick of the animal can be picked up with millisecond precision while rich recordings are being generated in the brain of the animal, multi-unit recording with tetrodes, and while millisecond scale cell type specific optogenetic interventions are being carried out through the fiber optic. All of this happening at once in the same freely moving animal. One can do projection targeting in rats uh, quite well. Of course, rats don't have the same uh, rich diversity of genetic targeting tools that mice have, but we've started to make headway on that front as well. Uh, Ilana Witten in the laboratory has generated uh, Cree driver rat lines that, allows, uh, that allow uh, genetic targeting of circuit elements uh, defined by Cree recombinase expression in, in rats. And uh, she and Liz Steinberg and Pat Patricia Janik have uh, together worked uh, to generate uh, a suite of uh, rat specific uh, equipment and hardware and also come up with some very interesting integrated transgenic rat and projection targeting experiments that all work together at the same time. I'll give you a flavor of how multiplexing these different targeting strategies has really uh, uh, helped us advance, in this case, the science of uh, reward or behavioral conditioning. In this case, uh, what we used was a tyrosine hydroxylase Cree driver rat, and this allowed uh, us to photosensitize only the dopamine neurons within the ventral tegmental area, and delivering light by fiber optic to these rats, only when the rats generated a nose poke, allowed us to see if this was, appeared to be rewarding for the animals, if they would work hard for light pulses, bursts of light pulses delivered to the dopamine uh, uh, neurons. And as you can see, this was very motivating. The animals would execute thousands of nose pokes per day. Only those animals that were actually receiving the light uh, that was uh, efficacious, in other words, animals that were Cree recombinase positive, only those animals showed this behavioral response. And it was not a nonspecific behavioral activation. The animals did not nose poke at an inactive uh, nose poke hole. And this showed all the typical properties of uh, acquisition, uh, extinction, reacquisition, uh, extinction by contingency degradation and reacquisition. Now, this was, as, this was uh, with transgenic rats, and so it was giving rise to cell type specific uh, 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 targeting and control in the rat. But one could also combine this with projection targeting. So one can illuminate not in the ventral tegmental area, but in one candidate downstream region, in this case, the nucleus accumbens. And here, uh, these intersectional strategies uh, allowed one to see that there was uh, 
uh, motivated behavior. In this case as well, the animals will work, although not as hard. Note the multiplier of 100 instead of 1,000, but the animals will work uh, quite hard for light that is recruiting the dopamine cells with their cell bodies in the ventral tegmental area that have projections to the nucleus accumbens. And so this kind of uh, integrated uh, specificity gives one uh, substantial experimental power. Now, uh, this uh, uh, is uh, an ongoing process as more Cree and other recombinase driver animals are generated. This will increase our understanding and our capabilities in optogenetic experiments, but already uh, a number of interesting experiments relevant to both basic science and disease have been achieved. Uh, Kay Tai, Leif Fenno, and uh, Rohit Prakash and others in the laboratory have been able to generate uh, uh, projection-specific studies of anxiety-related behavior. I told you about the cocaine conditioning experiments. Uh, Ofri Zar and Leif Fenno have been able to carry out social behavior work uh, uh, relevant to autism and schizophrenia. Uh, we've talked about the deep brain stimulation work uh, together with Susumu Tonagawa and others. We've been able to study memory uh, processes. There actually is a, 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 a number of uh, both disease-related and basic science questions that have already been addressed, but it's still early days, much more uh, to be studied. In fact, uh, optogenetics is not limited to the neuronal system. Uh, a number of groups are now working on uh, controlling glia, controlling cardiac function. Uh, applications to stem cells are also uh, growing and expanding rapidly. And uh, the versatility of the technique uh, we're just now starting to fully appreciate. So uh, this is uh, a brief summary of what we've uh, been able to do. Our collaborators are shown here. Our many very talented uh, students and postdocs uh, are illustrated here uh, who contributed to the work that I've uh, uh, been talking about. In terms of resources, we have a number uh, of uh, places that you can go uh, to access protocols, primers, and other tools. Uh, 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 protocol type applications. We've published in Nature Protocols a number of uh, uh, strategies, uh, uh, including step-by-step -step, uh, procedures for giving rise to optogenetic interventions. Uh, Primers uh, published recently in, in uh, um, uh, journals that allowed us to go into detail on the caveats, technical challenges, uh, conceptual strategies for carrying out optogenetic experiments. Uh, in this Nature Methods uh, paper, there's a detailed comparison of the different optogenetic tools, including quantitative parameters of kinetics, light sensitivity, uh, temporal stationarity, and others. And then finally, uh, our website, optogenetics.org, gives you an, uh, uh, access to all the tools, which we'll send uh, freely to you. Uh, just uh, shoot us an email, and we'd be happy to help. So that's uh, optogenetics. I uh, hope you found this useful. And uh, uh, look forward to hearing from you if uh, we can help you in any way. So thank you.